Welcome to the first entry in a collection of videos rolling out over the course of the next month where I will be revisiting every raid in the game providing a concise modern guide full of tips, tricks, easy skips and meta recommendations that competent endgame players typically use in order to make the experience fast, efficient and most importantly, fun. Over the years, older raids have been incredibly well optimised to the point where most competent teams can complete them in under 45 minutes or less. And through this series you will learn almost every possible optimization for each raid, down to the deepest level and more. This series is intended for players of all skill levels, so whether you're a raid report demon with a master speed rank or just a casual raider looking to improve, these videos will have something to offer you, I can promise you that. For the purposes of keeping the video length at a reasonable amount, I will assume that players watching these guides will have somewhat of a baseline understanding of each raid covered, so as to not go too far in depth on the core mechanics and focus more on the modern strategies used within them. The way these videos will work is that for each encounter I will provide a brief rundown on how the encounter works, followed by a focus on progressively more in-depth tips and tricks specific to said encounter. So today we're kicking things off with a classic raid originating from the expansion widely hailed as the greatest in the franchise, the Taken King, and with it, King's Fall. Entrance. The main objective in the entrance encounter is to dunk six sets of two relics scattered throughout the arena in the middle statues in order to open the portal leading to the rest of the raid. I would recommend Titans and Hunters to rally on Arc subclasses and Warlocks to rally on Heat Rises, plus all classes should be using an Eager Edge Sword if they have one, and you'll see why shortly. Typically in the past you would split your group 2-2-2, one group opening mid doors and each left and right group helping each other with carrying relics and clearing ads, though nowadays this can be done a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the new relic running method known as solo running. Turns out, you can skip the corridor to mid entirely on both sides while carrying a relic by following a specific route into mid. Any class can do these routes, but the class that has the easiest time by far is Warlock since you retain the ability to Icarus dash when holding a relic. In some cases, becoming amplified helps with making the jumps, as you will see now. If you are left relics, the Warlock route is as follows. The Titan and Hunter version is made a lot easier by having Speed Booster before you pick up, since the added jump height is needed due to no dash tech being available, however, this is not strictly required since you can also make the jump with high mobility, performed like so. If you are on right relics, the Warlock route is as follows. Specifically for right side, Titans and Hunters will need to have Speed Booster, while following the route shown. Since the route for right side relics is harder in general, you may choose to run right side as normal, and a big tip I can give for this is have your ad clear player heavy attack the taken doors with their sword and they will break it in a single attack, which saves a ton of time compared to shooting the orb. The last thing to mention when regarding entrance is exactly how the relic timers work, as I've often seen a lot of misconceptions surrounding this. The relic timers begin once they spawn, and if you pick up instantly, you get around 1 minute and 17 seconds. However, what this means is leaving the relics alone will still tick down the time so it is best practice to pick up as soon as possible rather than synchronizing with your other teammate. Moving on to perhaps everyone's favorite section of the raid, the ship's transition. Ship's transition. This area is really where you can show off the movement tech you've been learning in your spare time, which I will demonstrate now. What you're seeing on screen is one variation of the full warlock skip. Guardian down.
If you cannot well skate, this is not a problem, as all you have to do is make sure you have 100 discipline and starfire protocol equipped, pop heat rises at the last second and simply sword fly across, dashing when it's off cooldown and refreshing heat rises at the earliest convenience. Next, we have my favourite character to skip on, this being Hunter, and now I will admit this skip is pretty difficult to pull off, but I will show it regardless. Making sure you have stompies equipped, you're going to want to shatter skate off the ship at the very last second and space out your jumps as much as you can and as soon as you do your last jump, swap to your arc subclass with a pre-equipped blink jump and proceed to blink twice while looking up at about a 45 degree angle, which should perfectly put you onto the middle island checkpoint. Guardian down. If you don't feel like trying this, simply follow the normal route or improvise some shatter skates. The whole point of transitions is to have fun with movement tech, so feel free to mess around. Titans, yours is probably the easiest skip. Simply sword fly across with catapult lion rampants and you should be across in no time. Also, just a quick reminder that the first secret chest is off up on a ledge on the left side near towards the end. Moving on to the first proper encounter, totems. Totems. Loadouts wise, I would recommend everyone to use an Eager Edge Sword and the rest is up to you. Just make sure you have a method of stunning unstoppable champions. The main goal of this encounter is to constantly rotate the brand buff on each side to prevent the annihilated totems from wiping you. This is achieved by a mid player killing the brand claimer knights located on the elevated platforms, picking up the brand claimer and stealing the brand from the totem player on the same side. There are two ways you can decide to run this encounter and I will go over the easiest way first, which also just so happens to be the way most people run this, known as three man running. Three man running involves three people rotating on each side, which will have all three players in a constant cycle of number one, killing the knight and claiming the brand, number two, defending the totem, and number three, depositing stacks of Death Singer's power. This is the most foolproof method, however, you can also do things slightly differently if you're more confident with what's known as two man running, where two players rotate between the totem and depositing stacks, and the sole job of the third player is to kill the knights and make sure a brand claimer is always ready to be picked up by the player depositing stacks. Regardless of what method you choose, the encounter progresses at roughly the same pace, so it's just more of a preference. The main point I do want to emphasize, however, is that you should prioritize getting fewer stacks to mid faster rather than waiting and getting more stacks to mid slower. What I mean by this is that in the long run, it is more optimal to claim the brand from the totem player as soon as possible rather than let them get more kills for higher stacks. Some more general tips for totems is that the total number of stacks required for completion is 200, and that the unstoppable ogres spawn every 60 stacks, and they can be stunned even when spawning. In. That about wraps it up for totems, now on to the healthiest raid boss in the entire game, Warpriest. The Warpriest encounter progresses much like normal, but first let's talk about loadouts. Since the damage phase is relatively long at around 45 seconds, you will ideally want two Well of Radiance Warlocks and the rest is up to you. Gathering Storm, Blade Barrage and Needle Storm work great here and as you'll come to hear a lot from me, for most of these raids bar a few encounters I would strongly recommend against running a Tether Hunter and instead assign someone on Tractor Cannon, preferably someone running a damage super to complement it. For weapons, rockets work best here so make sure you have one player running Galahorn and you should be all set. As far as mechanics go, split your group 2-2-2 on left, middle and right and clear all waves of adds until the knights spawn in and once they are dead, the glyph phase begins. The middle player steps on the plate and scans whether left, right or himself need to step on by checking if the floating rocks are glowing white or not. If neither left nor right rock is glowing, this means that the mid plate is first, so the mid player should step off and on again and then read once more. The other three players not responsible for glyph reading should ideally be warlocks running Icarus Dash or Broodweavers running Grapple, since it will be their job to camp the taken knight holding the brand claimers to then quickly make their way to damage, especially if a knight spawns top left. For those who are unaware, the two brand claimer knights will always spawn in the opposite locations to the final plate which grants the brand. So if brand is mid and first knight is left, this means second knight can only spawn on the right side. Once every plate player has stepped on in the correct order, the final player is given the brand and should take it to the new most optimal damage location, the right stage. Using the same example of the brand being mid, once damage begins, the left and right knight player should stay behind and spawn kill their knights, each of them bringing their own brand claimer to the stage. Listen out for the brand timer and claim it accordingly, and if you've got a stack set up, you should be able to one phase, but if not, this fight is typically a comfortable two phase. Once the war priest is defeated, you move on into Golgoroth's cellar, aka the maze CP. Maze. 
the route for the mazes up on screen, including the locations of the plates required to open the secret chest, should your team choose to do it. The most important thing to remember here is that the maze CP just so happens to be the best AFK XP farm in the game, so if you want to hold on to the CP for farming reasons, simply swap to a different character, load in, and if everything went well, you should have just given it to your alt. Load back in on your main, and get ready to face the next boss in the lineup, Golgoroth. Loadouts for damage here are typically a little different since the damage phase lasts upwards of one and a half minutes, putting more of an emphasis on high total damage sustained DPS options. While rockets can work well here, I am instead going to recommend bait and switch cataclysmic for the huge reserve ammo it possesses, and in a similar vein, sleeper simulant or leviathan's breath are also pretty decent here. As for subclass setups, I recommend all warlocks to use Verity's brow fusion grenades and all titans to begin damage with a cuirass thunder crash, swapping to armamentarium after the fact for more pulse grenades and for hunters, either Blade Barrage or Gathering Storm works very well here also. It's also worth mentioning that the two gaze players should run Tractor Cannon and debuff Golgoroth between swapping the gaze for the rest of the team, and at least one damage player should be running Bastion in order to break the orbs very easily. Gaze players should also run a sniper rifle to make their life a lot simpler. In terms of mechanics, clear every wave of adds until the first bubble has spawned, and before you break the bubble, let one of the gaze players get his gaze. If you're having trouble getting his gaze and need someone to get his attention for you, Golgoroth will hard focus anyone who makes him slam attack, so if he happens to be misbehaving, have one of your damage players make him slam and then run to the rally flag so gazers can clearly see his back. Another thing to note about the gaze is that it's simply impossible to take it on the first round while he's in a slam animation. Regardless if you hit damage numbers, you cannot claim it if he is slamming, so keep this in mind. Finally, you can also take his gaze from the front of the room even if he's looking directly at you, provided you are slightly elevated and aim above his head. This method saves some unnecessary running about, plus having the added benefit of him facing the correct direction when damage begins. Once damage starts, progress as normal, making sure the gaze players communicate their timers to each other and move locations accordingly when the new orbs are broken. While slightly more advanced, gaze players can dip into the damage orb for about 5 seconds after their partner has taken the gaze from them, which is a nice way of chipping in some extra damage and securing the one phase. Furthermore, if the one phase is looking tight, once the final gaze has been stolen, the player who it was stolen from can enter the orb for the full duration in order to seal the deal. Once Golgoroth is defeated, we move on to yet another fun transition, Sister's Transition. You can go the regular route if you so choose, but the more fun way is to skate across if you know the correct starting point, which just so happens to be this protruding spike right as you enter the zone. If you've gone for the secret chest, you can instead follow the route on screen. Next, we're on to the penultimate encounter, Sisters. Sisters. Sisters and Oryx is where the raid can really be sped up if you happen to know the tricks I will discuss shortly, but first, let's briefly touch on loadouts. The sisters don't have particularly too much health, however, the ads in the arena tend to cause a lot of flinch when damaging them, which is why I would recommend going back to rockets for this one. Again, make sure you have at least one Well of Radiance and a Galahorn plus a method of debuffing. To begin, assign four people to each plate and have the other two players floating, killing ads and being ready to sub for any plate player who becomes torn. There are a few things to note with sisters, the first being that no one will get torn until someone steps on the first plate, which is just a nice thing to be aware of. Second, once the platforms are built, if you are the torn player, there are several jumping skips you can perform to speed up grabbing the pieces of the brand claimer, which you can see a short montage of now. Furthermore, the brand claimer itself can be claimed even without the platforms being built. All you need to do is follow the routes on screen. For this to work, Warlock players must have Heat Rises, Hunters must have Speed Booster, however Titans can simply get away with using Lion Rampants. While this trick isn't necessary, it does save a ton of time since anyone can do it, not necessarily the Torn player. These days, it's almost impossible to wipe on this encounter, so it's good practice to always slam the relic on the green glowing sister, because once dead, the next round immediately begins. Repeat the process once more until the second sister is dead. One thing to note here is that there is a way of killing both sisters at once, and it involves a very complicated strat known as desync cloning, which I will not dive into the specifics of, though if you're curious, a 2016 Toyota Corolla has a great video showing what this looks like. Now for the final boss himself, the star of the show, Oryx, the Taken King. 
Oryx functions mostly the same as Sisters in that the same tricks can be used for more efficient platforming and picking up the final brand claimer. However, there are a few things unique to this encounter that are worth mentioning. First and foremost, the rally flag is at the back of the room and Oryx is at the front of the room. Enough said. In terms of loadouts, rockets work well once again, with the only exception here being that Tractor Cannon is mandatory for debuff since Tether does not work on Oryx. As most people should know, killing a Light Eater Ogre will spawn a Light Eater Knight on the opposite side, so if an Ogre dies on L1, there will be a Knight on R1 which needs to be prioritised. But what you may not know is that the Ogres spawn in a set rotation direction, this being anti-clockwise. This information is most relevant to the float players since they can predict the spawn locations of the Ogres, allowing them to be spawn trapped more efficiently. For example, if the first ogre is R1, this means the next is R2, then L2, then L1. If you really want to, the ogres can also be marked by a Cenotaph Warlock for extra heavy ammo leading into the second phase. However, this trick does not work on the Light Eater Knights despite them having a yellow health bar. A common misconception I see when entering DPS is that you can only detonate the bombs once the chat prompt of Oryx calls upon the darkness triggers. And while this does work totally fine, the more optimal method is to enter the bombs as soon as he lifts his hand off the plate he is guarding. What this ends up up doing is giving you an extra two seconds of DPS time, which may end up making the difference on a one phase. If you fail to one phase, you are then faced with either the Thunderdome or the Seeking Mines, and as for the mines, you get rid of them by quickly killing the knights that spawn on the plates. When it comes to final stand, you should detonate both bombs at the same time, this time hopping in when the text prompt arises, and you shouldn't have any problem finishing him off. And that about does it. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you learned something. This is my first venture into longer content, and I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. God, let's see if I can hit this one. I haven't hit this one okay, since. Okay, Mike, okay, I'm going then. Dude, uh, I, I hate hitting that one. Yeah, it's it's carrying it. I'm the best. Oh, shit! I'm the fucking best. Yeah, Lama, so if you don't good. put that in the video, I'm gonna subscribe. What a I, wasn't I didn't watching. see. Oh. Sorry, That's, bro. You I'll, I'll, 